Also, the comics sure fits, where you take a look at comics both good and bad to determine whether or not they deserve praise or ridicule. Because we all know that there are some that deserve both. With that out of the way, let's get started. When you think about comic characters from the 1990s, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? If you first thought of that overly muscle guy with like two guns, the size of Fuex in his hands, and has unnecessary pockets for stuff he doesn't need, then well, you're right. There have been a fair number of characters in the decade who frankly look like they should just keel over for being so large. Growing up in the 90s, I've seen a lot of these characters in video games, magazines, and other media related things. And to be honest, I didn't really find them that interesting, because they were just too extreme for my taste. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here today because I want to show everybody the top 10 Marvel characters of the decade. Why Marvel? Well, I only just read them as a kid, so what are you going to do, right? Number 10, Carnage. Cletus Cassidy, aka Carnage, first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man number 344, and received the spawn of the Venom Symbiont after sharing a prison cell with Eddie Brock a.k.a. Venom. It takes a lot to say that with a straight face, I know, but that's how it happened, and comics got his chaotic Venom offshoot, which led to many more. Many, many more. Some backstory, during the 80s, there was a crossover event called The Secret Wars, and in it, Spider-Man got an alien costume that wanted to bond with him. So you can only imagine what happened next, right? No! The less said about that, the better. Spidey got rid of the suit and eventually it found and bonded with Eddie Brock to become Venom. Venom became a thorn in Spidey's side for years and is now the granddaddy of all symbionts out there in the Marvel Universe. All it took was Spidey sticking his hand into the wrong machine. The reason why I put Carnage on the list is because he took over New York City in the crossover event called Maximum Carnage. In it, Spider-Man had to team up with his arch nemesis Venom and a host of other superheroes like Captain America, Deathlock, Firestar, and others to bring this guy down. The character Carnage may look like a bloody mess, but he remains to be one of Spidey's greatest villains of the past 20 years. However, he did seemingly meet his end at the hands of the century. Literally. That happened in New Avengers number 1 just to show how badass Sentry is. Keep in mind that that comic was out in the last 10 years. While Cassidy may be gone for good, the symbiote still lives on, and Marvel is going to bring it back with a new host. Just like how Venom has been having new hosts from time to time, like how Matt Gargan, aka the Scorpion, was the recent Venom, and the Venom before that was, of course, Eddie Brock. It remains to be seen what this character is going to do. But you still have to wonder about Cletus Cassidy, because he was the first Carnage, and in my opinion, probably the best. Number 9, Sleepwalker. When Rick Sheridan falls asleep every night, he awakens the extraterrestrial entity known as the Sleepwalker. First appearing in 1991, this character was to pardon the pun, the sleeper hit character of the early 90s. What drew readers to this character was how his human host was very vulnerable to attack, where he'd just wake up and suddenly, Sleepwalker would just vanish in the middle of the fight. That kind of vulnerability, to me, made up all the crazy powers he had. Sleepwalker was capable of superhuman strength, flight, levitation, and the ability to go into people's dreams. He was one of those odd characters with his powers and stuff like that, but was still really unique. If I recall correctly, his defining moment came during the Infinity Crusade, where he took on several heavy hitters of the Marvel Universe. It's a shame that such a good and unique character has gone to waste in recent years, and even back when the book was popular. Because while Nova, Darkhawk, and other contemporary books sold really well, this character was really the underdog, and you can't really help but root for this guy. Number 8, Onslaught. What do you get when you take the insecurity and personal demons of Professor Charles Xavier and Magneto, the mutant master of magnetism? You get this guy, Onslaught. This combination of two of the greatest leaders of Marvel's mutant population single-handedly demolished the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, and everyone in his wake in the mid-90s crossover event titled Onslaught. Readers first got a hint of what was to come in the first X-Men comic I ever read, Uncanny X-Men number 282. The time traveling mutant Bishop happens upon a distorted message by Jean Grey that indicated that something horrible had happened to the X-Men. Years later, the full message was revealed at the cry for help. Before that event occurred, fame speculated what the message meant. Bishop had told the X-Men that someone had betrayed the team and led to their demise. For a while, people suspected it was Gambit, and eventually that was proven false when the Juggernaut was sent flying and laying down the X-Men's front door saying that an entity called Onslaught did this to him. I'm the Juggernaut, bitch! Yeah, not anymore, Juggy. 
Onslaught took out the X-Men and eventually Earth's many heroes sacrificed themselves by launching themselves into a psionic barrier since it was revealed that non-union energy was needed to stop the monster. What I remember the most about this storyline is that there were no real gimmicks or anything else like that. It was just a wild ride from start to finish, with surprises around every turn. And rumor has it that Onslaught may return sometime in the future. After all, evil does not stay dead for long. Number 7. Nomad, Girl Without a World. Spinning out the other slot saga came Heroes Reborn. During this storyline, heroes from the core Marvel Universe were teleported to a reality created by Franklin Richards, the son of Reed and Sue Richards of the Fantastic Four. The Heroes Reborn titles were by image creators who returned to Marvel to retell the origins of Captain America, the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, and Iron Man. Just by looking at these, you can probably tell that these books were everything wrong with comics in the 90s, especially Cap. I felt Cap isn't supposed to look like he's going to explode. Dad, now get away! That? That's better. The Heroes of One Saga gave us a female Bucky in Cap's mag, who eventually made her way to the core Marvel universe when her world was destroyed. She was the first spot in the books because, well. She was one of the only original characters there, and had a tremendous amount of character depth and a fan following. It was like the creators took all their energy to make her a complex character and just shoved the rest aside until they returned. She became Nomad, Girl Without a World, and I believe you should pick up this comic today. Number 6, Generation X. During the 90s, Marvel wanted to take training of new mutants to a whole new level in a book called Generation X. Admittedly, this isn't a new concept, but the difference is that with this group of kids, we see something akin to Giant Size X-Men number 1, where new mutants from various backgrounds were given the chance to learn from two of the X-Men's best and brightest. Their origin stems from the Phalanx Covenant storyline, where these techno-organic aliens threatened all life on Earth. The X-Men were kidnapped and these new mutants would end up saving the day. Generation X died until most of the people on the team were killed off or became X-Men themselves. The book was popular because it reintroduced people to the concept of training mutants while still being fresh and relevant. Number 5, Blink from the Age of Apocalypse. The 1990s were very unkind to the X-Men. We had Onslaught, and now we have this, The Age of Apocalypse. This storyline introduced number 5 on the countdown, Blink. Blink hails from a world where Magneto formed the X-Men instead of Charles. Apocalypse, the villain introduced an X-Factor, ruled the world, and Blink was one of the mutants on the team. She was originally introduced in the Phalanx Covenant storyline, and unfortunately was killed off. Her character was so well written that fans, including myself, just clamored for more on the character. And once AOA was finished, we finally got it in the form of Exiles. Exiles! This comic rocked in the 90s! Nowadays, Blink guards the nexus of all realities, as the new team of Exiles are brought on board every now and then to repair realities gone wrong. After her core Marvel counterpart, she did show up in a recent storyline called Necrotia, and it remains to be seen what will be done with her. To be honest, I don't really think anything should be done. Fans associate Blink with the Age of Apocalypse version, not the new one. Still, I'm not really sure what's going to happen with this so-called new Blink popping out, but when I think of Blink, I think of the one that's been in Exiles and Age of Apocalypse. Number 4, Spider-Man 2099. In the early 90s, Marvel experimented with a line of comics called 2099. In it, futuristic versions of present-day heroes were shown. Welcome to the world of tomorrow! We had Punisher 2099, Fantastic Four, X-Men, Doom, Hulk, and of course Spider-Man, which I'm talking about today, Miguel O'Hara. His story was that he works for the evil corporation and eventually got the same power as Spider-Man through some sort of lab accident. The reason he's on this list isn't because of his awesome costume or anything else like that. He's on the list because Spidey 2099 took all of what made Spider-Man so great in the 60s and successfully made it a modern day spin far better than Ultimate Spider-Man, which to me relied too much on shock value and not enough story. Spidey was different. Spidey wasn't a joker like his past counterpart. He was just less extreme than most of the others in the line, and it just made it a lot easier and a lot less confusing to read. After his title run ended, he appeared in the pages of Exiles alongside Blink and other heroes from other realities. All in all, he was a great character and was recently seen in Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions. 
Number 3, The Thunderbolt. While Earth's Mightiest Heroes and the Fantastic Four were off being drawn by image artists, there was a void in the Marvel Universe that needed to be filled. Filled with mysterious heroes that just popped out of nowhere. Meet the Thunderbolts. These heroes were fresh, and to the casual onlooker, they looked to be like generic new superheroes. Yeah, that wasn't the case here. These new characters were in actuality five members of the Avengers Batty team, the Masters of Evil. Thunderbolts number one soon became the talk of the town, as word spread out was a reveal on the last page. Led by Baron Zemo, who took the guys as Citizen V, the Thunderbolts sought out initially to gain the public trust and eventually betray them. This was Zemo's plan until, well, he and some of the other T-Bolts got a heart and decided to do the right thing without him. The book went on for some time and is still considered to be one of the greatest to ever come out of the 90s. Granted, villains becoming heroes is not a new concept. We just see hardened villains like Songbird, Mach 1, and the Fixer eventually care about turning over a new leaf, much like how Hawkeye, Quicksilver, and the Scarlet Witch changed their career path in the 1960s. What made the book special was how these villains were trying to redeem themselves for not just the people of Earth, or for the Avengers and FF who finally returned. They wanted to do it for themselves. However, there are still some wrenches in the works that other characters have had not so noble intentions for them. Because of the surprises around every turn, this comic earns the number 3 spot. Number 2, Dark Hawk. Alright, now we're talking about one of my favorite books of the 90s, and one of my favorite characters of all time. This guy is just too cool. He is Dark Hawk, and his real name is Chris Powell. First appearing in 1991, his origin is that he found an amulet of alien origin that allowed him to switch places with an alien battlesuit of some kind. It's sort of like Marvel's answer to the Green Lantern Corps, only the makers of the suit were recently found out to have less than noble intentions with the use of the powers. In the style of Spider-Man, he decides to fight crime in his native New York City, where he ran across Spidey and several other members of the older generation of heroes. The suit allowed him to fly, use a grappling hook, and generate blaster energy. To me, Dark Hawk exemplified the new comic characters Marvel made in the 90s. He was a teenager at the time, and had problems like any other kid. This should sound familiar to some, as the 1990s saw a genesis of new characters akin to the creation Stan Lee and others made in the 1960s. This was a new generation of heroes, and he was part of what really inspired me to get into writing the Star Vaults. Dark Hawk's comic was cancelled in the mid-90s. However, he showed up in the pages of Avengers vs. Coast, The New Warriors, and several crossovers around the Marvel Universe. In recent years, he was seen showing up in former New Warrior teammate Nova's book, and helping out his friend there. The character had evolved considerably since the 1990s, as he matured like most of the other teenage heroes at the time. He, like Nova, proved himself time and again in the recent Elma King storyline. When Nova's book in Jeopardy, I really hope we see this character again. Number one, The New Warrior. Here it is. This is number one on the countdown. This is my favorite book of all time, because it had nothing to do with extreme characters, muscle all over the place, pouches you don't need, and characters that just were too extreme. This is a really good book. This, ladies and gents, is The New Warriors. This book right here was one of the main inspirations for the Star Wars comics I do, and was written by one of the best writers of the decade. His name is Fabian Naziza, and he created what I think defined Marvel's genesis of new heroes in the 90s. They were formed to take on the street crime the Avengers and the Fantastic Four never really handled. However, that changed early on as more heroes were added to the roster, and the plot became more and more epic. More and more, the heroes of the book ruined popularity, and I likened them to be the next generation of Marvel's heroes, much like in the current book, Young Avengers. A few of the kids eventually grew up and became Avengers in their own right. Nova also saved the galaxy on many occasions, despite his book being cancelled several times, and remains close to my heart because it's what got me into writing in the first place. The stories were always exciting to read, and the characters were very deep. There were humor, and it provided me with a lot of action. It was just fun to read because you can easily care about these characters. Then came the 2000s. Out of all the characters on this list, the new warriors have been thrown under the bus more times than I care to remember. The comic was cancelled and restarted with a new premise, a reality show with superheroes. The art was horrible, and everyone's written so out of character that I couldn't get into it. The crew group just was not there, the characters did not seem right, and then came the kicker. Uh, the new warriors became the reason the civil war happened. 
They were filming another reality show in Stanford, Connecticut, when they thought it would be a great idea to attack a nuclear-powered hero without radioing for help. This led to the deaths of Night Thrasher, Namorita, and a couple of heroes I never really was a fan of. Beatball survived the blast and became a masochist named Penance. Nova and the others were doing other things at the time. Later, Justice, aka Marvel Boy, decided to restart the team, while another person made a team starring depowered former X-Men. That didn't last long, and the book was cancelled. Nova, in the meantime, enjoyed the rebirth as one of Marvel's top cosmic heroes, and eventually Numerita herself came back to the book. Now wait, what about Justice and Firestar? Well, after the Avengers, they split up, and Firestar retired from heroics altogether. Justice now teaches that Avengers Academy with Speedball, and everyone else is just split in millions of directions. It's a shame that all this happened in my favorite book of the 90s. These characters were really well written, I liked the storyline, I liked the romances, and everything was just really great to read. All of these books on the list were fantastic to read, and you know what? I think we're going to go back and read them again. This was Sifa, and thank you for watching Comics Showcase.